Do you know what a fallacy is? The dictionary calls it a mistaken belief, especially one based on an unsound argument. Here's one we've all heard. Evolution is a theory, sure, but so is gravity, and you believe in gravity, don't you? Or, I can't believe the Bible because I believe in science. Coming up next, Blunders in Reasoning with Dr. Jason Lyle. friends, welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman and it's my privilege to be your host. It's really great having you with us today. Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. We have a great guest with us today. I'm really excited that Dr. Jason Lyle can join us. It's so good having you with us today, Dr. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. We're wonderful to have you with us. Well, today we're going to talk about blunders in reasoning. Uh, who's blundering and how, how do, what's going on? Well, lots of people make mistakes in reasoning. They make blunders in reasoning, which we call fallacies. Uh -huh. And uh, what I want to point out is that evolution, most of the arguments that we hear for evolution are actually based on these fallacies, mistakes in reasoning. And so if we were really thinking properly, we wouldn't be evolutionists. Now, that's not to say creationists don't make mistakes in reasoning, because we do that too. And I think that's an indictment on us. We, we as Christians should be thinking logically. It's actually our obligation as Christians to think logically. To think logically is to think in a, in a, in a way that's consistent with the nature of God so we don't contradict ourselves or anything like that. So the obvious conclusion is that you have looked at your belief base your, as a creationist and says, this logically makes sense. That's right. I believe the Christian worldview is logical, is self-consistent, and it makes sense. Wonderful. Well, help all of us to think logically, will you? Okay, logic basically is the study of reasoning, the correct reasoning and by implication incorrect reasoning. Yes, sir. And so uh, when we talk about logic, we're not talking about, you know, specific fossils or things like that, but rather what conclusions can we draw from given facts? So usually the, these certain facts are assumed and then what conclusions can we draw from that? And if you make a mistake in that chain of reasoning, that's, that's called a fallacy, a mistake in reasoning. Okay. Now, it, we often talk about arguments when we talk about logic, and I should be clear, I'm not talking about uh, sh a shouting match when people think of arguments. That's what right. they think of sometimes. I'm talking about making a logical case for something. Okay, so an argument is basically where you have a group of propositions. A proposition is a statement that either affirms or denies something, like the sky is blue or something like that. And, um, it, you know, it's affirming something. And it's where you have a group of these where the truth of one is claimed to follow from the truth of the others. And so, for example, if we said all, uh, all mammals have kidneys and all dogs are mammals, it would follow that all dogs have kidneys. That's an argument. Okay. Now, in the case of uh, logic, we've, there are several different aspects of an argument. I'd like to point those out to you. Please do, sir. Uh, we have what are called premises and conclusions. Now, the, the premise of an argument is one of the things that's usually taken for granted. So, for example, all mammals have kidneys. That is a premise. Um, all dogs are mammals. That is a premise. That is, we take it that that people already believe that, and then the statement that's being proved is called the conclusion. So therefore, all dogs have kidneys. That's the conclusion. So um, an argument has one conclusion. It has at least one premise. It's usually they has, it has more than one. If it has two premises and one conclusion, it's called a syllogism. And those are a very common type of argument. Now, a fallacy is when you make a mistake in that chain of reasoning. And so let me give you an example of a fallacy here. Some mammals are cats. That's true. All dogs are mammals. That's also true. And so you conclude, therefore, some dogs are cats. No. Uh, it doesn't follow, does it? So that's a mistake in reasoning. Now, the premises here are true, but the conclusion does not follow from them. And so that's an example of a logical fallacy. That's not one of the kinds that comes up. That's a pretty obvious one. Most fallacies are more subtle, which is why people commit them so often. If they were obvious, then they wouldn't be so common. So a fallacy is a common error in the chain of reasoning. Now, there are two different sorts of logic, two different kinds of logic, deductive arguments, and that's where the, the conclusion definitely follows from the premise. And so the, ki the kinds that we were listing so far, 
or deductive arguments. And that's a perfectly legitimate kind. There's another kind, though, where they're inductive. And that's where the, the conclusion is likely, but not absolutely proved from the premises. And both of those are perfectly legitimate ways of reasoning. It's just an inductive, you can't be, you can't be definitive. It's probably right. and not definitely. That's right. With inductive, it's a probabilistic kind of argument. Yes, sir. And we're going to deal mainly with that kind of logic today, because of the, most of the fallacies that evolutionists commit are this inductive variety. And so there are three categories of informal logical fallacies, fallacies of ambiguity, where there is something unclear about the language. Uh, there are fallacies of presumption, where the argument assumes something that it really hasn't, doesn't have the right to assume. And then there are fallacies of relevance, where the argument simply um, is not, the conclusion isn't relevant to the premises, although it seems like it is. That's why it's a fallacy. It seems persuasive. Fallacies tend to be persuasive. It is, people tend to say, yeah, that makes sense, but no, there's something wrong with it. And so that's like why my mother always thought that, so it has to be true. It, there you go. That's an yeah. example of yes. a, that's, that's appeal uh -huh. to authority. And so uh, let's, let's cover ambiguity. There's, there's about six fallacies that are commonly listed. Now, we won't go through all these. We just don't have time. But I thought perhaps if the viewers wanted to, on their own, um, look up these, these other fallacies, they can do that. And so uh, again, there's something unclear in a fallacy of ambiguity. So with an amphiboly, there's, there's, some kind of, there's something in the sentence structure that's unclear. So for example, if I said the uh, student center is giving away free guitars, no strings attached, that would be an example of an amphiboly, because <laughs> you know, no strings to the yeah, guitars. Yeah. Or, you know, what, it, what does that right. mean? So there's, there's something unclear about it. And so that's, that's an ambiguity type of fallacy. There are fallacies of presumption, where, again, it assumes something that you really don't have the right to presume. And you can see there are quite a few fallacies in that category. We'll just hit a few of the, uh, of the ones that, are, that most occur in origins uh, debates. And then there are fallacies of relevance. And so this, again, is where the conclusion isn't strongly related to the, the premise, so like the genetic fallacy, where the, the source of the information, you take that into consideration in terms of uh, how good the argument is. You, an, an argument really should be evaluated on its own merits. Now, uh, equivocation is the fallacy of shifting the meaning of a word within an argument. There are lots of words that have more than one meaning, and that's great, but you, you can't shift the meaning in the middle of an argument. Otherwise, it's a, it's a fallacy. And so I'll give you an example of an equivocation fallacy. And then we'll apply this to some more realistic scenarios. Practice makes perfect. That's, yeah, there you go. Doctors practice medicine, therefore doctors are perfect. I know some doctors that believe that. They probably, they yeah. probably do, but that's fallacious, <laughs> isn't it? Because it, it, yes. um, it's, it's uh, equivocating the on the word, practice. which word? Practice, that's right. Because mm -hmm. practice in the sense of medicine or in the sense of doing something over and over. People say things like, you, well, you believe in science. Sure, don't you? Well, evolution is science. Therefore, you should believe in evolution. Mm -hmm. And that sounds very logical. But of course, they're using science in two different senses. Yes, I believe in the method of science. But when you talk about evolution being science, well, it really isn't science in terms of the, the general method. They're talking about a specific model of origin science, which is not as powerful as operational science anyway. So they're conflating those two terms. Or people say, here's another one that comes up all the time. Evolution is a theory, sure, but so is gravity, Gravi right? And you believe in gravity, don't you? So they're trying to say, well, you'd be silly not to believe in evolution because it's like, just like gravity. That's an equivocation because they're using the word theory in, uh, in two different senses. Evolution is a theory in the sense that it's not proved. But when they talk about gravity being a theory, actually gravity is more than a theory. It's a law. But in any case, they're talking about theory in the scientific sense of something that's been established over and over and is verified by experimentation. Now, that's not true of evolution. No. You, can't, you can't demonstrate that in a laboratory, certainly not. And so they're equivocating on that particular word. Very common fallacy. Reification is another one that I find is very common in the literature. And this is one that just in, in often in conversations with evolutionists, you'll, you'll, you'll hear this particular fallacy. It's where you attribute a concrete and often personal characteristic to an abstraction. And if it's, if it's personal, it's sometimes called the pathetic fallacy, not because it's so pathetic, but like as in empathy, you're empathizing with the thing. And so uh, with reification, basically you're, you're giving a, um, uh, a, a, something that's abstract a concrete characteristic. And I'll give you a real common example of this. When you, when you hear evolutionists say, well, the evidence, this evidence says that evolution is true. Now, evidence, like a fossil like that, it doesn't say anything, does it? It's not, it's not literally true. I mean, the fossil says, I said no such thing, right? That's what it's thinking. Well, maybe not. You see, it's a double reification there. You get, you get the point. It's not thinking either. Okay. That's right. That's right. And so you see, but if it, you know, if it would, I mean, if evidence said something, you better run, because evidence doesn't talk. Okay. And so that's, that it's giving, he's giving a, uh, concrete characteristic to an abstraction. And just a few other uh, examples here. Evolution figured out a way around these problems. You'll, hear, you'll see that, in, that kind of stuff in literature. You say, well, how did, how did it jump from here? Well, evolution found a way. 
as if evolution had a mind and could figure things out. It's a concept, and so it doesn't have that characteristic. But you, you read this all the time in That's evolutionary right. writers. That's right. That, it's, very that it's making this big plan and working out its plan. As if it could think, as if it could reason. Right. And you see they do that because it bypasses the point that life really does need somebody to think through these issues and yeah. it needs God basically. And that's not a substitute. Life will find a way. It's a line from the Jurassic Park movie. Yeah. You know, where he said, well, life will find a way. Well, an organism might find a way, but not life as a general abstract concept, okay, because it doesn't have a mind like that. Or nature selects those individuals that are most fit for the environment. Nature selects as if it had a mind. Now, I do believe in what's called natural selection, but the term actually is a fallacy of reification. Yes. And we let evolutionists get away with that. We really shouldn't. Or the evidence speaks for itself. It doesn't. Evidence doesn't say anything. Natural selection guided the development of, of these organisms as if, it, if, as if it had a mind, as if it could think, as if it could guide. Science is atheistic in its outlook and procedures. Science has beliefs about God, really? I don't think so. And if it did, it certainly wouldn't be an atheist because <laughs> science comes out of a Christian worldview anyway. Right. But no, science doesn't have beliefs like that. Science is a tool that, that God has given us. And so when they say things like science says, you probably heard people say, um, you know, well, creationists say this, but science says, well, science doesn't say anything. Science is a set of procedures. It doesn't have a voice. Scientists say things. Now, I think there's a reason why they, because they could, they could fix that by saying scientists say, but they don't say it that way. I think there's a reason for that. And what's that reason, sir? If you, uh, if you put scientist, all of a sudden, you've got a fallible person who can make mistakes there. Whereas right. if you use the word science, it sounds like so this monolithic... So it sort of puts them on the equal ground with the creationist. That's right. Because you could say, well, but there are creation scientists who, who disagree with that. But if you say them. science says, as opposed to the creationist says, that puts creationists outside the realm of science. They're the superstitious ones. Sure. Yeah. Yes. And that's it treats right. science like this monolithic entity that's infallible. Yeah. yeah. Once, you put a, once you put a scientist on there, all of a sudden you've got a person who can make mistakes. That's and that's, right. that's why they avoid saying it that way, that's I believe. That's really a good point. We have bifurcation fallacy where you falsely, um, it's also called the false dilemma or the either or fallacy. And that's where you falsely assume that there are only two possibilities when in fact there is a third or, or more. And so, for example, if I said either the traffic light is red or it's green, that would be a bifurcation fallacy because it could be yellow. Okay. So these are like red and green are what we call contraries, but they're not contradictory because you could, there is a third possibility there. Either Bob will go into the ministry or he will move to Kansas. <laughs> Maybe he'll do both. He could go Maybe to he'll the ministry do neither. in Kansas. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so the, the point is there are other possibilities. Um, or somebody might say, I don't live by faith. I'm rational, you see. Now the implication is either you live by faith or you're rational. And I would say, I live by faith because I'm rational. Yeah. And it's because I have faith in God that I can be rational. Those are not contrary positions. And they're trying to say that people of faith are not people of reason, mm -hmm. which we, we believe is absolutely the opposite of the truth. That's right. And yes. so you, and that is a, that's a fallacy. Mm -hmm. When they say it that way, it that is, is a, just a, a blatant mistake in reasoning. Or somebody says, I cannot accept the Bible because I believe in science, either the Bible or science. You see the either or fallacy being committed there. Well, wait a minute, I believe in science. I've got a PhD in science and yet I believe the Bible. It's obviously not contradictory to believe in both. Uh, either the universe operates in a law-like fashion or God is constantly performing miracles. Well, it seems to me the universe could operate in a law-like fashion most of the time and maybe God occasionally does a miracle. Although a miracle is not necessarily outside the laws of nature anyway, but that's a, that's a whole can of worms. But the point is there is a third possibility there. And when it's not mentioned, it's a bifurcation fallacy. Now, what about, here, I'll give you an example here. What about if Jesus, because Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. Is that a bifurcation fallacy? Is it a fallacy? Could, could God make a mistake in reasoning? No. Of course not. He's God, right? God is the source of all logic. Right. So in the case when Jesus says that, there really are only two positions. There is no really neutral are. when it comes to God. So it's only a fallacy if there really is a third, if there's a third position, as it is in this case. Or the, how about this one? I, I had a Christian say this to me. He was, he was funning with me a little bit. Because he said, oh, he says, the Bible teaches that in Christ, all things hold together. But now we know that it's gravity and electromagnetism that hold the universe together. And he was just funning with me a little bit. But the, the fact is, it's, you know, it's, it's a bifurcation fallacy. Either God upholds the universe or gravity does. But it seems to me gravity is the way that God upholds yes. the universe. It's both. Yeah. God upholds the universe by the laws of nature. He does it by gravity. That's right, and electromagnetism. Mm -hmm. the, the laws of nature are descriptions of the way God upholds the universe. That's what I, the way well I look said. at it. We have the question-begging epithet. That's where you use biased or emotional language to uh, establish a point, to persuade someone of a point that's not logically established. So somebody says, this criminal is charged with the vicious murder of the innocent victim. 
uh, he could have put that in a more, a more neutral way, right? He could have said the suspect is charged with the, do we know it was vicious? He was charged with killing the other person. We don't know it's a victim. We don't know they're innocent. You see, he's used emotional language to try and persuade you this person's guilty when maybe he isn't. And so when somebody says, I pray you'll have an epiphany and stop misleading people to believe in nonsense and lies. And, uh, well, that assumes quite a bit, doesn't it? It sure does. Because I, I could say, you know, I was just thinking that about you, right? Because you see, in my I'm world sure view. you have time to yeah. unpack that. Yeah, yeah. A lot <laughs> that's there. Quite a, that's yeah. a lot in there. Somebody was complaining about our Dr. Purdom. She's a molecular geneticist. Sigh, this woman received her PhD in molecular genetics from Ohio State. Our department is becoming infested with creationists. Infested? Really? Yes. Yeah. You see the, the emotional language there that's present in that in that uh, like statement. Disease, yeah. yeah, exactly. And so that's that's trying to paint uh, creationists in a negative light without really having a, a basis for it. Question begging epithets can be subtle, like evolution versus creationism. They attach the ism here, but not there, implying that this is just a belief. You see, whereas uh -huh. that's a fact. Now that's very subtle, but you'll see that in the literature. Or Genesis teaches that God created six days. However, the best scientists. Best yes. being the operative word there, as if to say, you know, if you're a real scientist, yeah. then, you know. Stupid people believe this, but real scientists yeah. believe the other, right? That's what they're, that's what yes. they're saying. That's a question-begging epithet. And they're doing it very subtly. That's right. Yeah. Then we have the ad hominem fallacy. This is where an argument is directed against a person rather than his or her position. Very common. So, for example, uh, somebody says, uh, uh, Joe is a mean person, and so you really shouldn't believe anything he says. <laughs> well, maybe he is a mean person, but nonetheless, maybe he's got a good argument. Yeah. You should evaluate the argument on its own merit not on the person that's uh, making the argument. And another example of this is what we call the circumstantial ad hominem. And that's a little different. You're not making fun of the person there, but you're pointing out that the person has an investment in making the argument that he's making. And, uh, but the point is, that's fine. Maybe somebody does have an investment. So what? That doesn't, that doesn't affect the cogency of the argument. And so, for example, if somebody says, well, you're only for higher gasoline prices because you work at a gas station, all right? Now, he says, you're, you're just making that argument because you've got an invested interest. Okay, maybe I do, but that doesn't mean my argument is necessarily bad. Maybe there really is a good argument for higher gasoline prices. I don't know what it would be, but the, the point is you can't just swipe the person aside because of that. Or somebody says, you'll, you'll hear people say this, you're just a Christian because you were brought up in a Christian family. Now, I'm sure that helped. I was reared in a Christian family, and I praise God for that. But that doesn't mean I don't have some really good arguments for the Christian worldview. It'd be like saying, well, you just believe in the multiplication table because you were taught it in school. Yeah, that's I mean, right. If it, it, is, it is true, I probably wouldn't have figured it out on my own, but that doesn't mean I don't have a really good argument for the multiplication table, like the fact that it works and, you know, I can use it in my daily life and so and, on. And so ultimately, at the end of that, you still have to say, but is the argument true? That's right. And, you and can't that's, just look at the person, you have to look at the argument. That's right. So you can see how this is a fallacy because the person is really just sidestepping the whole argument and trying to just look at the person who's making the argument, but that is not relevant. Uh, to the argument at hand. Dr. Jason, this is so helpful, but we have to take a break. And when we come back, I know you have some more good stuff for us. So don't you go away. We'll be right back. Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Jason Lyle, has a PhD in astrophysics. He is currently a speaker for the Institute for Creation Research, where he has authored several creation articles and books, including Taking Back Astronomy and Ultimate Proof. Book orders are being taken at 800-337-0375. Astronomy and physics have always been areas of special interest to Dr. Lyle. He enjoys viewing the night sky through the telescope and was very instrumental in developing the planetarium at the Creation Museum in Kentucky. Jason can be reached at Institute for Creation Research, P.O. Box 59029, Dallas, Texas 75229, or visit the website at icr.org. We are back with Dr. Jason Lyle, and we're in the midst of, a, I think, a fascinating show talking about blunders in reasoning, some of the logical fallacies that are made in the evolutionary uh, debate. And uh, Dr. Lyle, uh, we left off talking about ad hominems, where you attack the person instead of the argument. Uh, what is the next uh, fallacy we want to look at? One of the next ones is uh, the, the fallacy of a relevant thesis. And it comes up quite often, and that's where basically an argument does prove a point, but it's not really the point that, it's, that is at issue. 
And so, and it, but it may sound relevant, you see. And that's why it's tricky. It, fallacies tend to be per persuasive because, uh -huh. they, because they are tricky that way. So it is an example of irrelevant thesis when it, when it says, uh, the people who want to reduce the amount of nuclear weapons are mistaken. After all, such an action will not solve all the world's problems. Well, <laughs> true, it won't. But that's not the point, is that's it? Right. You see, yeah. and so it's irrelevant to the point that they're trying to make. And I find that that occurs often in evolutionary literature when they'll say things like, why is the universe ideally suited for life? Well, because if it weren't, we wouldn't be here to observe it, right? <laughs> that's true. And you'll, you'll hear that argument. They, they, you know, they say, well, that's, that's the uh, anthropic principle, you know, that the universe seems to be designed for life because if it weren't, we wouldn't be here. But I want to suggest that's a fallacy. It's a fallacy of a relevant thesis. I could use a similar argument and say, sp suppose I was the sole survivor of a plane crash, okay? And somebody comes to interview me. Well, Dr. Lyle, how did you... You know, how were you able to survive that plane crash? And I would say, well, because if I didn't, you wouldn't be able to ask me the question, would you? <laughs> it, that doesn't go it to doesn't, how, does no, it? No, it doesn't. It no. doesn't explain why I was the, the survivor. And so when people say, you know, that, well, if the universe weren't designed for life or di didn't appear that way, we wouldn't be here to observe it, that is true, but it's irrelevant. To, it doesn't explain why the universe appears designed for life. The reason why is because it is designed for life. Yes, it's so finely tuned that there has to be a tuner. That's right. And they don't want you to get to that point. Mm -hmm. That's right. Another example would be why do, uh, why do living creatures have these complex parts that function so perfectly together? Because, well, if they didn't, they would have died off. Right? <laughs> now, it is true that yeah. they would have died off, but um, that doesn't explain why they have the complex parts. Yeah, and how complex it is. Yeah, I it, see what you're saying. That's awesome. I mean, if you think about it, natural selection ex explains why we don't have animals that don't are not adapted to their environment. It doesn't explain why we do have animals that are suited to their environment, you yes. see. It's God that's required for that explanation. That's right. And so that's why these are all fallacies of irrelevant thesis. Now, the interesting thing about fa the fallacy of irrelevant thesis, it's very easy to answer. All fallacies of relevant thesis can be answered with a simple retort, true perhaps, but irrelevant. That's all you gotta say, true, but irrelevant. Doesn't prove your point, sir. We, have, right. the, uh, we have the straw man argument. That's also another one that occurs oh, just so often when evolutionists say, that's basically where you misrepresent your opponent's position and then you show how easy it is to tear down that misrepresentation of their position. And so you'll hear this when they'll say things like, well, creationists believe that God created all the animals as we see them today, right? Now that's, but you see, here's the thing. We don't believe that. And so when then they, just, but they say, but see, some breeds of dogs are quite recent. They think they're disproving creation. They're not. They're disproving a misrepresentation of creation. Because the fact is, I don't believe that God would have created poodles in the Garden of Eden, right? No. Because they're, they're, you know, they have all these mutations in them and everything, and they're running around biting your leg and so on. It'd be pretty <laughs> tough to get every uh, kind of dog on the ark. Every they? different variety, that's yes. right. There's, we only need two dogs on the ark. We believe yeah. in speciation, we believe in diversification. Right. Uh, we just don't believe that all life is descended from a common ancestor. So that's a misrepresentation of what we believe. Of course it's easy to refute that silly position, but that's not what we believe. And so you can really think of it, you know, when, the, when these evolutionists say things like, well, you know, creationists, they're flat earthers. They don't believe in science. They don't believe in change. Uh, first of all, we believe in a round earth. The Bible talks about that. We, we do believe in change. The Bible tells us the world was once a paradise. Today, things aren't, you know, exactly perfect. Things have changed. We do believe in science. I would argue as a creationist, the, the science comes out of a Christian worldview anyways, because God upholds the universe in a consistent fashion that we're able to do science. And so you see that's a misrepresentation, but it's very easy to knock down that position. You know, these creationists, they're so dumb, they don't believe in these things. Well, we do, you see. And so that's what it really comes down to. All right, faulty appeals. We have faulty appeal to authority, for example. Actually, different, there are many different faulty appeals, but the faulty appeal to authority is when you appeal to a person. You say, a claim must be true because so-and-so says it's true. Okay, but the problem is people are fallible and they might be mistaken about that. Even experts can be fallible. Now, it's not wrong to say this expert believes in this and that gives it some weight. Nothing wrong with that. But if you say this has to be true because an expert believes in it, especially if it's not in this field. Because people will say, you know, they say, well, this guy's a PhD biologist and he believes in evolution. But see, I don't understand how having a PhD in biology qualifies him to talk about what allegedly happened millions of years ago. Right. He doesn't study millions of years ago, he studies today. Right. And he's very knowledgeable about how life works today, but not millions of years ago. So that's a faulty appeal to authority. You can have faulty appeal to majority, where you say, well, you know, mo most people, it. yeah, most yeah. people believe that, so it's gotta be true. Well, most people can be wrong. Dr. Lau, I just wanna say, I'm glad you're on our side. Well, thanks. And I just think that, uh, your lesson today, your Origins program with us today has doubly blessed us because it's pointed out some fallacies that we all need to hear in the evolutionary argument that I think just validates our faith in creation. I think it's a, it's a tragedy that logic isn't taught in our public schools. Ninth grade should be the place oh, where yeah. kids learn to think 
conceptually and, and building premise upon premise to reach conclusion. Uh, it would it would make critical think thinkers out of them and prepare them for life. It would. So far fewer would be evolutionists, in my and opinion. Far fewer would be yeah. evolutionists. So we have the double blessing there. So thank you for being with pleasure. us. pleasure. Thanks. My friends, I am so glad you've joined us today and got to hear Dr. Jason Lyle talk about many of the fallacies in the evolutionary argument. I challenge you as a Christian. You know, we're often accused that Christians are the ones who aren't thinking. But I want you to learn to be a critical thinker because when you see things through the lens of Scripture and you see a logical God who has built an incredible world that, and made us in His image so we could understand what He made and what He did, it will bring you to kneel before our Creator and to love Him with all your heart and to share His truth with a world that's believed a lie. I want you to know God so that you can believe forever that it's God's view that He created you. And that should be your worldview too. Great having you with us today here on Origins. I hope you'll join us next time. And until then, God bless you. My Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1204, Cornerstone Television, Well, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.